Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, earlier this week, Bob uh, Benmosh, CEO of AIG, the insurance giant, which took $85 billion in bailout money from the American taxpayer, said that congressional outrage at the ensuing bonuses paid to these executives in AIG's failed fraudulent phony financial products unit was, quote, just as bad as Deep South lynching. Let me tell you something, Bob. Uh, if AIG's financial products unit were indeed chased down by a crowd of angry taxpayers and defrauded investors wielding pitchforks and hangman's nooses, as you suggest in your interview, history could one day possibly look on this as an act of great injustice, a stain on the soul of a population who had violently repressed innocent bankers based simply on the color of their derivatives. But I doubt it. Stacy, what is going on here? Max, he's referring in particular to AIG's financial products unit, the unit that is based here in London, headed by Cassano, who, remember, the whole bank went bust, the insurance company went bust, $85 billion in uh, taxpayer bailout. So he was just interviewed in the Wall Street Journal, and he suggested that when Congress was against paying bonuses to this very unit here that destroyed the insurance company, well, that was I equivalent to the lynching faced by African Americans in the South. AIG CEO Robert Benmosh compares bonus criticism to lynch mobs. This is from Matt Taibbi, and of course he uses his unique way of describing the situation. He says, AIG has a lengthy history of producing some of the biggest tools on Wall Street. Former CEO Morris Hank Greenberg was considered one of the world's preeminent unapologetic narcissists even before he sued the government for providing an insufficiently generous bailout. Joe Cassano, former chief of AIG's financial products division, was another. First, he arrogantly blew off the accountants who warned him his portfolio of hundreds of billions in uncollateralized bets might destroy the world. And then secondly, he appeared before Congress and uh, berated them for not giving him his money. Right, right, right. So the AIG executives getting the bonuses in, in addition to $85 billion in taxpayer cash. Um, they feel persecuted. They feel persecuted similarly to the way black slaves in America were lynched, raped, tortured, and murdered in the Deep South. He, he sees a kinship there. That cracker on Wall Street sees a kinship with the way blacks were lynched you know, here's what I think black America should do in light of this revelation. They should demand reparations for having built the United States of America. They are owed, by some calculations, and this was an issue a few years ago, five to seven trillion dollars in cash right now, black America. This cracker thinks you're not, his suffering of taking billions in bonus money is equivalent to you building the entire country that he now profits from. He's also, you know, the bank, the, I keep on calling it a bank, it wasn't really a bank, it was supposed to be an insurance company. And they were selling credit default swaps, which they couldn't, they didn't have any reserves against it. A bank pretends anyway that it has reserves. Remember, an insurance company doesn't need any reserves. So they went bust with those. Now he's also, however, saying that not only were we blameless here, but even the, the rest of the population is to blame. He calls them the villain. It's the, the people who took out mortgages that they couldn't afford that are to blame. It's the nations across Europe that went bust that are to blame. No, the fact is the black population in America was lynched again because AIG yes, and yes. the credit default swap market was fueling the subprime crisis, which led to foreclosure on Americans, black Americans who had taken out mortgages on properties fraudulently sold to them by Bank of America, by Citigroup, backed up by fraudulent non-insurance products like credit default swaps marketed by AIG. They've had a huge wealth confiscation and they're feeding into the prison population. I got a good insurance insurance product, it's called black insurance. If you're born black in America, there's like an 80% chance you're gonna go to prison. If you have a black child, mom, get black insurance, because that kid's going to jail and you need to pay for it right now. There's a huge business right there, AIG. Why don't you get into the black insurance business? This guy's, he's unconscionable. I can't believe that as an American, I have to put up with people like this calling themselves American. Well, 
another way to look at this is, of course, to see when we had all the lynchings in the South, and it happened well past slave days. It happened up until the 1940s and 50s, so 60s. So it's, it's not something that ended with slavery. But not very many people lined up to be lynched in the South. However, in America today, everybody is lining up to be just like Ben Moshpit. We'll call him Moshpit, okay? Because it's easier that way. <laughs> the AIG CEO. The headline reads, should we worry about unproductive financial sector gobbling up our best? This is from Robert Schiller, and he says the economic value to society of so many of our best and brightest making their careers in the currently popular kinds of other finance has yet to be pinned down. So again, remember that notice during the South, nobody lined up to be like them. Everybody's lining up to be like the CEO of AIG. That's what everybody wants. Well, in a survey of elite U.S. universities, Catherine Rample found that in 2006, just before the financial crisis, 25% of graduating seniors at Harvard, 24% at Yale, and a whopping 46% at Princeton were starting their careers in financial services. Because they want to get lynched, like this guy at AIG. Because <laughs> lynching is, is what people aspire to now in America. They go to Harvard, 25% of the graduating class says, I want to be hung like a black man in the South. Can I get into the finance business? I'm a victim. I was, they forced it billions of dollars of bonuses on me. I'm a victim. Oh, I can't stand it. I'm being lynched. <laughs> I, I can't say, man, like James B Brown is rolling over in his grave right now. That's the problem with America. Since James Brown is gone, it's complete lack of funk. Well, okay, so Bob Benmosh, remember I said he's, he's essentially in financial services as an insurance company, but it's the new sort of other financial services. So I'm going to read to you what this involves. According to a study by Thomas Philippon and Ariel Reshef, much of the increase in financial activity has taken place in the more speculative fields at the expense of traditional finance. From 1950 to 2006, credit intermediation, i.e. lending, including traditional banking, declined relative to, quote, other finance, including securities, commodities, venture capital, private equity, hedge funds, trusts, and other investment activities like investment banking, or in the case of AIG and Bob Benmosh, it was this financial products unit. The products were CDOs and CDSs, which blew up. Well, what it means basically is that a graduate of one of these schools will go to Wall Street and they'll take a pile of debt that will never be repaid, and they will mathematically figure out a way to reclassify this debt as some newfangled piece of debt that, again, will never, ever be paid. And then AIG will write a credit default swap, which, again, is completely uncollateralized and not insurance by any definition. And they'll say it's OK to trade, even though it's based on collateral that in itself has no value whatsoever based or referenced or collateralized by another piece of debt, which itself has no collateral either. In this cantonated Ponzi scheme that has reached $700 trillion globally and is now virtually guaranteed to cause massive social unrest a debt bubble burst and complete reconfiguration of geopolitics as we know it today, as the BRICS basically tell the US and the UK, fungu. Well, you bring up slavery, and this is this this notion of the chains comes into this uh, story from Robert Schiller. He compares these guys like Ben Mosh, Bob Ben Mosh from AIG, and all the other people in other financial services as being. Um, the neo-feudal lords as erecting chains across a river to prevent people from crossing it where they used to be able to uh, cross it freely. And they were just putting up chains and charging people. They're intermediating between something that was previously free, uh, commerce was flowing free, and then they just, they look for ways to rent seek. Right. And one of the ways that the chains are being manifested in the public domain is through higher inflation. When people end up paying more for food, more for gas, more for health, more for education, that is the result of the cost of these chains being artificially implemented so that access to capital is, is constrained to only people who know Bob Benmosh and his financial terrorism scheme and is, look at me, please lynch me, ha ha, you won't, a slap in the face. And then, so with this, we're going to move on to where these, this neo-feudal system that Robert Schiller is talking about and our best and brightest going into that, we have our also not so best and brightest also seeking to go into finance, i.e. our politicians. Money, 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 money. 
<laughs> this is a headline about Bill Clinton. So if Americans are worried about money and politics, there's no larger concern than the Clintons, who are cosseted in a world where rich people endlessly scratch the backs of rich people. So Bill Clinton last year earned $17 million, uh, including to Lagos, a Lagos company where he spoke for a $700,000 speaking fee. Hillary Clinton is currently receiving $200,000 per speech. And between 2001 and 2013, since leaving office, Bill Clinton has received $106 million from these speaking fees in his book. Right. Al Gore is now with $500 million since leaving office. Bill Clinton now worth $100 million since leaving office. Tony Blair since leaving office making millions and millions of dollars. If you're prime minister or president, it's something to put on your resume. Barack Obama will make $100 million once he leaves office. To be the president is no longer the top job. It's just something to put on your resume as you head toward consulting with a major bank. And Bill Clinton, by the way, I believe was voted into the Black Hall of Fame at yes. some point. Yes. Bill Clinton is not a black man, okay? I'm more black than <laughs> Bill Clinton is. Bill Clinton is a cracker. He's the very definition of a cracker. He's not, a, he's not a homeboy. He's not a black man, okay? By, by compared to Bill Clinton, I am frickin' James Brown. I am Parliament Funkadelic compared to Bill Clinton, okay? I defy him to sit in that chair and let the world see who's blacker, Bill Clinton or Max Get Down Kaiser. <laughs> I well, defy it. Well, but here again, here's the President of the United States who helps to determine policy and regulation and how the justice system is applied across America. So you have on one hand Bob Benmosh comparing his situation, his plight of people being berating him for receiving huge bonuses despite receiving an $85 billion bailout, when he's cosseted and protected by the Congress who gave him the bailout. And in the meantime, what happened to all those black subprime victims who had all of their wealth confiscated? Remember, the largest confiscation of a black American wealth since the slave days. I remember the days when black is beautiful and uh, when there was a movement, you know, but now it's, it's gone, man. The black man is gone in America. It's just not there no more. It's all just Bob Benmosh. <laughs> all right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half. I'll be speaking with George Galloway. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to George Galloway, a member of parliament for Bradford West. George is making a crowd-funded film called The Killing of Tony Blair. He's raised 80,000 pounds so far, but there's another week left for you to participate. George Galloway, welcome back to Thanks the Kaiser Report. Thanks very much. Report. You were here when you launched this project. Yes. Here, we're 80,000 pounds later. We've got a week to go. Tell us what's happening. Well, I'm hoping to reach 100,000, uh, just because that's a magic number. And uh, we still have uh, around a week to achieve that. And I, I'm confident that we will do that. There will be a Twitter storm, a Facebook storm, an internet storm in general to try and drive that number up. Bigger budget, bigger production values, yes. right? I mean, we can do more uh, location work on some of the scenes of his former crimes. We can employ more researchers and get deeper into the labyrinth of... Uh, of hedges that he has uh, uh, constructed around his business affairs. We can go for cinema release. We can go above all for feature length. We want it to be a feature length documentary. Right, so uh, it's closest in a week. If you get to 100,000 pounds with a huge interest behind you, there is then the possibility that you would go for a greater budget even with the festival circuits in mind like the Sundance Festival, et cetera, and really compete head to head with in that global documentary market with this very important story about the killing of Tony Blair. I want to talk about crowdfunding for a second because mm -hmm. crowdfunding itself here you are, George Galloway, somebody who's beloved by the public and around the world, who doesn't always get a great voice here in the corporate controlled media of the UK, who's going totally around that with this project and getting huge response. Can this concept of crowdfunding be applied to politics? In other words, would there be a, a, a day when a politician, instead of going to the corporations, instead of going to the banks, is funded directly through the public through crowdfunding, your thoughts? Indeed, um, with thousands of small donations, you can do better in every way than going after a few oligarchs and being compromised by the money that they give you. Uh, this was pioneered in the United States. You remember Howard Dean's presidential run, uh, which uh, generated phenomenal sums of money in small amounts from large numbers of people. 
President Obama started out his fundraising that way and then quickly switched to the big corporate donors and look where that uh, has gotten us. In Britain, it's never been done before. I hope to be the first person to do it. If I run for Mayor of London, with you as my economic czar, then I'm going to try and crowdfund that campaign. We need to raise a million pounds, get a million votes, and if we do, we'd be the mayor of London, and the bankers would be jumping in the river because they would know that a mayor and his team had arrived that would not allow them to lay the city of London waste in the interests of the city of London. So crowdfunding does have political applications. I'm absolutely sure about that. Now, we do the show in front of this building behind us, and I don't know if everyone knows it, but that is the official headquarters of the mayor mm. of London. Mm. So you're thinking that for a million pounds, through crowdfunding, you could mount a credible campaign to become mayor of London. Well, I will have raised £100,000 for a movie in 40 days, uh, if this last seven days goes to plan. Uh, we don't need to raise ten times that over a longer period. The election is not for three years. For something just as significant as a movie, arguably much more okay, significant. Okay, but the point is that, you know, isn't crowdfunding doing something that you would have expected to happen in democracy? I mean, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, what happened to democracy in all this, George? You're it, a it, student it, of history. Yeah. What happened to the participatory democracy? Well, it, it is a democratic way of funding something in an era when the very lack of democracy in funding has led us to the corporate control of virtually every aspect of our lives that the rulers would like to impose upon us. And look where it's got us. It's not just that it's not uh, moral, it's that it's completely incompetent, ineffective, not working. So a better system has to be found, and I think democracy in this and in every other respect is the best way forward. And crowdfunding is the purest form of democratically funding action. Making a movie, storming the Bastille of the mayor's office over there. We could put out a, a plank like they do in the pirate ship, and Boris could be forced to walk the plank. It could be. Here's the Thames River right here. <laughs> it's not much of a drop. Only if you can guarantee some crocodiles in it. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this film. The killing of Tony Blair. Yeah. As you mentioned, the corporatization of politics has led to the corporatization of the political animal so that they have a life when they get out of office. Mm. Bill Clinton is now set to make $100 million from uh, going around the world. His wife, Hillary, charges hugely for speeches. Al Gore, $500 million for sale of his TV network in the United States. Tony Blair is one of the dodgiest of the lot. Um, he is around, going around the world, this is kind of the basis of your film, and he's making a killing, kind of cashing in on his uh, reign at the Prime Minister, where he said there was no blood for oil, and yet he's out there cutting deals on the oil patch, clearly it was blood for oil. Tell us more. The concept first coined by you that the Prime Ministership, the Presidency, no longer is the pinnacle of your career, but merely a step along the way, an entry on your resume, on your way to the big job, the job that makes you rich as Cretius. And Tony Blair, who, by the way, as this film will show, had a constant insecurity about money. He went to a public school, he went to a fancy Oxford college, he liked the airs and graces of the upper class, but he never was upper class. He always felt financially insecure. So he's been as busy as a bee for seven years, making a pile of money, tens of millions of pounds. And that's his real job. His real job was to use the Prime Ministership of Britain to create an environment good for the corporations and to create a world environment good for the tyrannies. And the tyrannies and the corporations are now making him rich. But here's the point. This kind of thing is an inducement to the current crop of rulers. Look what happened to Tony. Look what happened to Al. Look what happened to Bill. You play ball with us. And when you're finished office, you'll be as rich as you could possibly have imagined you might ever be. And that's a fundamentally corrupting thing. In the case of Tony Blair, his stated mission with his new corporate entity is to bring peace in the Middle East. That's one of the mandates of his organization. And yet, it seems he's doing the absolute opposite, mm. stirring up a storm so that the weapons dealers make money, the oil dealers make money, and everyone else, the middlemen make money. Everyone's cashing in on this, doing the exact opposite of peace. 
He's not part of this quartet of peace. He's part of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, bringing death and destruction to the Middle East. That's what galls people. That's what sticks in their craw. Not that he's making money. I mean, okay, he's making money. Why shouldn't somebody make money? But that he's making an, an egregious amount of money by doing the exact opposite thing he says he's doing and by taking advantage of his position as a public uh, official. Well, I, I couldn't have put that better myself. The, the, not since Caligula appointed his horse as a proconsul of Rome, has there been a more inappropriate appointment than Tony Blair as the Middle East peace envoy? Not only is he dripping in the blood of the people of the Middle East from wars gone by when he was in power, he has incited war after war after war and supported war after war after war in the very Middle East. The minimum ambition of our movie, The Killing of Tony Blair, is to have him kicked out by at least one member of the quartet. Our maximum ambition is to see the cell door slam shut after him at The Hague because we believe he ought to stand trial for crimes against humanity, for war crimes in The Hague at the International Criminal Court, a court which he himself supported the establishment of. Of course, Donald Rumsfeld can't travel in Europe be for fear of being arrested and mm -hmm. taken to The Hague because Indeed. of war crimes. Tony Indeed. Blair has a similar cloud or not yet? He has a toxicity about him in Britain which, for example, was the reason David Cameron lost the vote on the proposed Syria war. Blair was hovering there Let like a ghost. Let me just stop you right there, George Galloway, because you're in the House of Commons. That clo vote on the Syria war was close. Yeah, 13. And, and very close. And, you know, you're in the House of Commons. Your way of thinking, after years of anti-war demonstration that a lot of people said went nowhere, finally, with you in the House of Commons and a lot of other like-minded folks, there was a defeat of a war initiative, really the first time in hundreds of years. So you're on the, some would say, the margin. However, when it came to that vote in the House of Parliament, it tipped against that war. So now you and your like-minded MPs have redirected this, the history of this country. Quite so. Not since 1782 has a British Prime Minister been defeated on a matter of war and peace in Parliament, and that was... Lord North in connection with the war against the uh, revolting American colonists. And so it's historic by any measure. It also was decisive. If we had not taken that decision by just 13 votes that day, President Obama would have launched the war that weekend. But because we voted the way we did, he had to stop and take stock and take it to the Congress and events moved in a way that President Putin and Russia swept up diplomatically and have run rings around the U.S. administration. But it would never have happened if our vote hadn't gone the way that it had. And how important are so-called alternative media like RT and other networks and media outlets that are going against corporate media in, in changing the way people are thinking in the House of Commons? Massively. And everywhere you go, people say, we saw Max, we saw you, we saw you on Max's show on RT and other uh, means, the, the, the YouTubes and the Facebooks and Twitter and all the rest, we are able now to get around. I mean, I get absolutely no justice from mainstream British media. In fact, nowadays, you have to work hard even to persuade me to go on mainstream British media because I don't need it, because I can reach just as many people without having to jump through the hoops and suffer the opprobrium and uh, contempt that these people habitually show people whose views, it's turned out, are in the majority in the country. So, uh, all power to RT, all power to Max Kaiser and the Kaiser Report. Well, I'm going to be your financial advisor when you are mayor of London, and we've already discussed some of the proposals, the plank uh, for the current mayor to jump in the Thames, I think is a good one. But let's talk about this project, because we have about a minute left. Mm. So, it's called The Killing of Tony Blair. It's on Kickstarter. Kickstarter.com. You go to Kickstarter.com. You find this project, The Killing of Tony Blair. You can put up five pounds or dollars or whatever. Five, five pounds will put your name at the, in the titles of that movie for all time. Right. And if it turns out to be as historically successful as we hope it will, wouldn't that be something to have just for five pounds? And there are all sorts of incentives. Give 100, give 200, give 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. If you give 5,000, you're then an executive producer of the movie. So your name's not just in the titles, it's up there in the opening. And also, I want to mention something, and we only have about 20 seconds, that for anyone in the world who wants to fill the role of the whistleblower on Tony Blair, mm. they've already two or three people have come forward yeah. and said, we've got stuff we've been sitting on, yeah. in re like with Prince Bandar, the Saudi Arabia, all that dirt that we know yeah. of that he was involved with up to yeah. his neck. 
If you want to step forward and be a whistleblower, then they can contact your organization and you can start to build that into this project and really dig down, drill down into the scum that is Tony Blair. Uh, that's exactly the case. If we can get people with information they haven't been able to bring forward yet, ours is the vehicle to climb aboard because this movie is going to be seen all over the world. It's going to have a real impact. Now is the time to blow that whistle on Tony Blair. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. George Galloway, thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Fantastic. Great to be here. And that's all the time we have for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, George Galloway. Uh, go check out this project on kickstarter.com, The Killing of Tony Blair. You have just a few more days to help make something big happen. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.